Hello everyone and welcome to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration and Crastorio 2 where today, well, we've got a few things to look at. There's been some advancements in sciences, of course, and also we've been trying to keep various different processes running around the factory. So let's take a look at what's been going on. The first thing is that I've implemented Mark's new um, thermofluid cooling system over here for the deep space science because previously we had well we had we had a range of problems. It was uh, down here with the antimatter wasn't being produced, and it was sort of it was a slightly funny one because at first I thought it was because we weren't able to bring the the uh, supercooled in fast enough, but it turned out to be we weren't getting rid of the uh, of the warm quickly enough from down here, so all the buffers were filling up, and that meant that the tanks up at the top here had managed to fill up because there wasn't any being stored in the buffers in the radiators, and so. Well, it turns out basically all of that boils down to, or freezes down to, they're not just straight up not being enough of these radiators. So instead of having them coming out all the way to about here, we now have them coming out all the way to here. However, they're all now in the uh, in, under the spell of this uh, of this wide area beacon here, which is making them all run at presumably much much faster. Yes, almost five times their normal speed. So that's really good. It's churning through it nice and quickly. And as we look around, you can see there's this sort of flickering effect going on on the pipes up here. This is because this is the warm thermofluid that's being produced as a byproduct of trying to make the super chilled stuff. So we want to get rid of that as quickly as possible. And that's working really well because it's going down here through these, well, these are non-return ducts. They seem to have some sort of pumping abilities as well, though, given that the other side of them appears to be fairly full. And um, and so that's managing to then churn it, push it back into these into the uh, radiators over here to be chilled down to the cool again, which, as you can see, is completely full. These are working really nicely. We've got lots of yellow lights along here, which tells us that these ones have managed to get caught up with where they're supposed to be. So we've still got another 500 to get rid of before it can then run again. So it's good. that's going really well. But then there are also quite a few of them where we see the green lights, and the green lights mean that they're actually running at the moment. That then flows up here, and we do the same thing up here with these hypercoolers, and these ones all have green lights on them, and that means they're running as fast as they possibly can. They're also under speed beacons as well, but these these are, these, so these ones are also running at uh, almost six times their normal speed here. So this one is running, as you can see, flat out, but the uh, the output is disappearing as quickly as it's making it, to then go up to here, where actually we could pro it looks like we need some more of this stage, because there's four machines up here that don't have enough input for them to run. So I guess we'll, uh, well I'll, at some point I'll put in some more of these, these uh, hypercoolers to, to feed these ones, and then that feeds through and we get the uh, we get a certain amount of the super cooled thermofluid up here and that is all then disappearing down into this pipe and as you can see the pipe is still only at about 15 20 well, 10 less than 20 percent certainly and so we're, we're still not producing it fast enough so I think I am certainly going to have to extend it definitely this level in the middle because that's the uh, the limiting factor at the moment this is the one that is running absolutely flat out um, with the top one isn't running flat out because there are some machines that can't run and the one at the bottom isn't running flat out because the output is full uh, this this one this output is full so yeah, we definitely need to extend this one. I think we also need to extend this one as well. I don't think another fifty percent is going to be sufficient. Although we 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 will see. We may, we may we may find it is. But also we are at some point going to start using a lot more of the deep space sciences because at the moment you can see that up here, this is this is stationary. It's got full supply, full output. But at some point we're going to do enough deep space science that we're going to pull a load more of these catalogs through, and then there's going to be more machines using using the uh, thermofluid over here as well. So I think making this area a lot bigger is going to be a very very important thing. However. The rate it is currently working at is enough that if we look down here, you can see that I was going to say that most of these are all working. They're not all working, but they're doing better than they were before. Uh, the outputs at least are full, um, and so we now have we have a, a certain amount of antimatter stream coming out here, and that was enough. At least it was enough when I looked previously to fill up this machine here and to fill up this passive provider chest here, meaning that we had a sufficient supply of the antimatter canisters for Mike to carry on making his Arcosphere collectors from. However, it looks to me like he has returned from a trip and therefore he's claimed all of these and is trying to make yet more. So I guess... I was going to say the next thing I did was then come over here and start filling up the train and then this tank. So it looks like we've got got to the point where we probably shouldn't be doing that anymore because we're still not making the uh, antimatter fast enough. So we should flip that round, and that means that now at least all the antimatter can go down here and go into this and go into this canister production. And you can see that that is now filling up much more quickly than it was before. And okay, it still needs a thousand to make an antimatter stream uh, capsule, but at least it's now able to get there a bit more quickly, and uh, and we should we should get a slightly better output rate of these, and that should keep Mike happy. Now, eventually, we would in theory fill up the buffers here. We'd fill up this train. In fact, the train is nearly full, and we'd then fill up this tank to the the eighty thousand that we're, uh, I'm trying to fill it up to. And so at that point, we would eventually allow all of the um, the antimatter to flow through here. Perhaps what I should be doing is putting in an additional tank on the other side here, quite a, whatever the smallest tank is. And I suppose the smallest tank is is this one, which is a little bit funny because it's got the 
it's, it's got the corner pipe connections. It's, a, it's the vanilla tank, and it's still half the size of the smallest Crastorio tank. So I think that is the correct one. To, this one would be the correct one to use. And actually, given given where this given where this is, it would be it'd be quite easy to remove that and that, and then put one of these tanks in there, and then just run a pump there like that and pipes in and appropriate hook it up to here and tell this to only in fact I could have two pumps one that only runs if this tank is is basically is full and then have this one only run if this tank is less than no, 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 a percent full so between the two of them they, they we, we could have this uh, this uses as a, as a an overflow and then have as much as we have available there while still prioritizing the uh, plasma the, the antimatter down here for the uh, for the antimatter canisters which are needed for arcosphere collectors Speaking of Mike and Arcospheres, he then took out the um, the, the long range combat ship, the Caladrian, out to go to the uh, to go to some more distant um, distant asteroid fields and start looking for some more Arcospheres. And so he went from Kalidas here. I think he probably went by by Finestra. In fact, I know he went by Finestra, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, he then went off to do Stardew, Black Mirror, Cosmic Dustlands, and Stone Circles because they're all in a nice little clump over here. And if you can do lots of the ones that are clumped together, it reduces your travel time and your fuel costs quite a lot. And so he, from here, he was able to gain a load more um, Arcospheres. So he did he did five Arcosphere collector launches in each one and managed to get 12 out of the first two and 10 out of the last two. So each of these is almost certainly going to be getting five Arcospheres from each one. Uh, so I don't I can't remember whether that's one per launch or whether it's uh, whether you get two for the first launch and then there's one of them that doesn't get one. But anyway, launching five we decided was a good number and it gets you five Arcospheres. So that's quite a good return rate. And you then get a little bit of a top up which is how he's managed to get 12, 12, 10, 10, because he's still managing to pull them out of the deep interstellar void. We haven't quite diminishing returns down to getting about zero each time. He's still getting one or sometimes two on average from each launch. And that has brought us up to a total of 96 now in the, in the, in the whole system here. So if I, if I look at this, this, this chest here, well, you can see we've got about 24 in there, but that's because they're all going out and being used. Now, if we look at this signal here, we can see there's about 50, 60 of them. It's kind of hard to tell because the numbers jump around all over the place. Um, but there's a, that's showing the number that are in the warehouse and on all of the belts around here because they're all connected up. That's why we've got these, that's why we've got these ugly yellow boxes on them all everywhere, just because that's how you wire them all together and read absolutely everything. So you know, so you know where all of your archosphere well, you know how many of each type of arcosphere you've got. So the plan is that then these these all get spat out here, and they're, and they're being streamed out by his clock system across the top here that I talked about a couple a few weeks ago, and the, and that bring and that means that over here we we're seeing we're seeing you can see down there in the on over on the right that we're getting a pulse of the various different types of arcospheres. Each time that pulses. The inserter over here will pass, pass out one arcosphere, and it'll drift around here. It might get grabbed by the machines along here in order to make the uh, the, the, the data cards required for Deep Space Science Three. It might come; they might come around here in order to go into this machine in order to make the tesseracts, or they might flow all the way around and go back in again. So, in theory, if we had an arbitrarily large number of arcospheres, we'd be able to keep the whole thing balanced, and we'd be able to continually send out a steady stream of arcospheres around the around this belt here and we could potentially then put as many machines as we wanted around it and we just have a big sushi system and we could then separately sort them out and send them out to these machines in order to fold them and keep keep the system in balance it's kind of working uh, for the system to work as it is we're going to need a few more arcospheres yet so mike is going to have to go out on a few more trips which is why i'm still talking about and messing around with the uh, the antimatter production so he's going to need a few more trips and maybe bring us up to 150 200 something like that when we've done when we've got roughly twice as many arcospheres i think the system is going to work quite nicely and as you can see at the moment, these machines here are all running quite happily. We are pretty steadily, because these are the ones that are sort of the top priority. They're getting a, a steady stream of fresh arcospheres of all types coming out along here. And so they're, they're working reasonably well. They're feeding the, uh, the data cards along into this machine, which is then, as you can see, is in fact running at the moment. We don't seem to have a backlog building up yet. Maybe, some, maybe we need some speed modules along here. Or maybe we just let it run until we've got a backlog of them down here. Because this, this is actually starting to build up a, a, a gradual backlog. So it's... Yeah, it seems to be kind of basically working in a way. But this brings us on to the other big thing that Mike has done, which is to put in this machine here, this grab facility, that's making the Naquium Tesseracts. So this is a, an increased dimensional thing. So originally you have, um, you, you start off with Naquium plates, or technically you start off with ingots, but we're ignoring the ingots. You start off with plates, which are two-dimensional. Then you make them into cubes, which is being done over in the deep space, the original deep space science area. So they're three-dimensional. Then you make, then you combine some of those and you make them into Tesseracts, which are four-dimensional, but you can't really display that in, you certainly can't display it in two dimensions. It's really struggling here. And those 
those then wobble out along here, drop down the belt, and they can get and they can be fed in down here, where at the moment they're being used to make the, the tier three deep space science packs. Uh, although we seem to have a shortage of coolant over here, so it looks like this is another place where the coolant system is going to need to be upgraded. So uh, well done there. There's going to be yeah, going to need to be some big upgrades along here by the looks of it because we've got we've just got too many machines. Yeah, all all the way up here, all of the well, some of these Arcosphere machines actually no, that I think yes, all of these Arcosphere machines are using thermofluid. So we're getting through lots of it up here. We're getting through some of it in this machine and and so on. We're getting through a lot of it and we just haven't really upgraded it. We've just sort of built up and built up and built up along here with all of the extra sciences. And there's this very, very early game um, <laughs> thermofluid chilling system running down here. It's still using uh, thermal radiator wands, mostly. So, yeah, a big upgrade is needed down here. So that's going to be another copy of uh, Mark's thermofluid design, the one I showed you at the beginning of the video. Anyway, <laughs> so it's running a bit slowly because we have a shortage of thermofluid. But that means that up here we are able to chug through and, and make a... A very slow trickle of the Naquim Tesseracts, like that. Well, he's putting some of them into a box over here for some, for reasons, because of reasons. Um, I'm, I don't know where, the, where those are being taken away to, but apparently they're needed somewhere. Where is that bot going? Oh, it looks like it's coming over to here somewhere. So there is something up here that's being made. Oh, I see. Uh, I think Marcus started stealing them in order to make the um, in order to make the, the uh, wide area beacon twos. Because yes, there we go. There's some Nequim tesseracts. So those are going to be kind of pricey, but they are going to allow us to make things run incredibly quickly. Uh, that's spoilers for later on, though. So I'll uh, I'll, I'll stop talking about that. And so yes, uh, we managed to get all of this running. Mike put all, in all the belting along here, but then he had to go to bed. So uh, so after we researched uh, Deep Space Science three, act the actual packs, Tristan then came along here, set up the recipe on these three machines. So they are now capable of running. We, I won't say they are running, but I will say they are capable of it, at least when all the rest of the ingredients start to trickle through. And finally around here, Mike also had to went through and tidied up all of the Arcospheres that got uh, sort of lodged in the machines. Because the because of the way it works, if, if you don't have things perfect, working, everything working perfectly and smoothly, because perhaps you only have 96 Arcospheres instead of the 200 you actually want, you can see you get problems like this, where we've got a couple of Zetas that are sort of tied up in this machine. So he went around and grabbed up all of those spare ones that were caught up and put them back into the central system here. Uh, because there were about 30 or so of them. No, he says about half of them. So, well, yeah, we're looking at about more than more than 45 of them being stuck in the various machines. And if we look over here, you can see well, there's a couple of each, but that's that's sort of fairly normal because that's a machine being ready to make ready to make run three times before it has to get more stuff. Over here, we've got actually over here, yeah, we've got two of the Zetas and none of the Zys and one of the Lambdas. So. It's a bit out of balance there, but mostly it's these machines that will end up grabbing a couple of Zetas or a couple of uh, Gammas. And that happens because the system goes, oh, we're a bit short of whatever it is that we need for this recipe. I'll pass some out and they'll get and they'll trundle uh, and they'll trundle around there, but it'll only be able to unload one of them because we've actually run out of one type of Arcosphere in here. And so then the machine will snaffle it up like that. But, it, but until it gets some Fies, it can't actually use these Zetas, so they just end up sitting there and uh, and not being used, which is a little bit of a shame, but it's a problem that will eventually go away once we have enough Arcospheres that the system can just run and keep itself reasonably tidy. Or there might be a little bit of tidying required from time to time, but also it, it, it won't matter. If you have 50 Arcospheres and 40 of them are caught up in the machines, then you have a problem. If you have 200 Arcospheres and 40 are caught up in the machines, then you have, well, you have a very, very small problem. It matters a lot less. And if you have a thousand of them and you've lost 40, then it doesn't really matter at all. It's absolutely fine. On his travels, because he was going to quite distant asteroid fields, Mike was using the Fenestra trick, which is that Fenestra is the same distance from absolutely everywhere. Now, if we look out on the map, it's Fenestra from Kalidus. It's about it's about that. It's about this far because we've worked out that going to um, Stardust via Fenestra is slightly quicker but not enough quicker to make up for the faff of having to do the extra sort of extra setup and extra control and extra managing and, and all that sort of stuff. So all of the ships that are going to Stardust will just fly there directly. However, technically it would be slightly quicker. So Finestra, so going to Finestra and back is about here. So I guess that means Finestra is about this sort of distance. And so uh, Mike was using the trick of going there in order to get out to more distant asteroid fields. And he stopped off here and pointed out that there was the broken Stargate over here. And, and he was asking, well, should I repair it? And we, and, we, and we said, yes, yes, that sounds like a good idea. So we all, we all watched while he did. And, when, and after, he, after he repaired it, put, put the ring back together, this platform appeared at the bottom. And this is a thing that uh, it looks like a lot like the rocket silos in that you can feed stuff into it and it will do things. We don't actually know what those things are yet, so at some point we'll need to set up some sort of power supply, a supply of the uh, cables and the processors, batteries, space pipes, but all being brought out here so it can churn through them. And I suspect because, you know, it looks like a Stargate, these things along here, well, 
you can click on it and you can, uh, it, it can, oh, it can output signals. So maybe we'll run cables from there and we'll read what's off it, on it. And I don't know. This is the, uh, this is the very, f this is the first taste, well, second taste. This is an early taste of the, uh, the archaeological challenge. That is what, what is the alternative way of winning the game other than just making a ship go very, very fast for quite a long time. So there is a puzzle set up in this and it, 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 it revolves around, we believe, it revolves around this Stargate and the various pyramids that are scattered around the universe. So each major Major planet has a pyramid on it and you can go down there, fight off some biters and you can rescue a tier 9 module. However, as well as the tier 9 module, there's also some sort of design on the floor like this or this uh, that you can have a look at and you can then do and then there is some sort of puzzle that pulls all of this together and we, 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 haven't, we haven't thought about it at all yet but we're going to be looking at that once we've finished all the basic sciences and maybe once we've done the spaceship victory or, or we might deliberately not do the spaceship victory so we actually trigger a victory when we, when we complete the archaeological stuff. We also noticed while we we're over here and looking at it that there is this wrecked ship over here and Mike was going to go in and just salvage everything from it because, you know, you might as well. It's, it's, it's resources. Now, a lot of it is junk, so these things, these ruins can perhaps be turned into scrap if we're lucky. Maybe not. There's a load of scrap in here that we can recycle. There's some condenser turbines that, I mean, we use condenser turbines, but not in particularly large quantities. There's rail, which is nice. Uh, there's a huge number of combinators up here. But then we noticed that some of these combinators have got stuff set on them. So we ran some power over here using, um, using Mike's spaceship that it was parked down here, and then running it up, running the power up these uh, pylons along here to, 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 to power up the, uh, the ho this whole area. It doesn't seem to be anything particularly exciting. We've got a little bit of logic programmed on these uh, on, on these combinators here. We've got this one saying if S is left greater than zero, then output the input number of C's. We're outputting 236 million C there and minus 2.1 bajillion here. It, uh, it, it doesn't look that useful or interesting, but we thought we'll leave it here just in case there's some sort of clue in that that we haven't, um, haven't really discovered yet. There's also a handful of the uh, Naquium processors here, which we haven't even developed in, in 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 real life in the game yet, so we can't we can't make those, or we don't even know what they are. But there's a few there that we can grab if we want them. Uh, there's also some, some uranium ammunition, which we haven't really been making, and then some basic guns and a, and a thruster suit as well, which is all very nice. Yeah, there's a little bit a little bit of stuff scattered around, but uh, how useful most of it is. Oh, and some more Naquium accumulators; those would be quite nice to nick. But yeah, you can see, there's not a lot of great of particularly valuable stuff here. I did nick a load of it when I first came out to Finestra, but I've left, but left, I left um, some of it behind, partly because I was too lazy to salvage all, all of it, and partly because I, I didn't notice these, um, these accumulators, or somehow this solar panel, because apparently I'm just not very observant. On the subject of Arcospheres, Tristan has been doing some updates to the uh, to the Graphomatron, and so you can see down here we've got all the different types of Arcospheres. And rather than being any sort any kind of absolute number, these are all being displayed as uh, as percentages. So does that mean that all of these are? I'm not quite sure exactly how this is supposed to work. I'm guessing that the it's, it's percentages of. If they maybe if they were all balanced, they'd all be at fifty percent, I guess. And maybe this—I don't know why this bar is the biggest, but also red. So um, I don't know. I'm not—I'm not quite sure what's going on here. Tristan has mostly told us that well, here is the um, the the their archospheres are being monitored on here, and it is giving us information. Uh, but um, and whilst it is giving us information, I'm not quite sure what that information is telling us. Maybe Tristan will tell me in the uh, in in the comments for this video or before the next stream, and I can discuss it then, or maybe in the next video. <laughs> There's also been some other fiddling on this area as well. So over with the um, the, the smoil area, the, the, the all the things that are produced by oil processing, it's um, it's no longer really relevant to have them on the graph because as I touched on last time. All of these things are made on demand, so there's no point in monitoring how much sulphur we have because when a train turns up, we'll make sulphur to fill it. And the same with plastic. There's no point in monitoring how much plastic we have in storage because a train will turn up and then the machines will go, okay, there's a train here, I shall make some plastic and they'll churn it out and fill the train up. So there isn't really anywhere to monitor for, say, sulphur anymore. And I would say all plastic, except the plastic is a little bit funny because we have this overflow area here that is making plastic. And so this one becomes a problem if it gets too full. And so what Tristan's done is he's inverted things a little bit for the plastic down here. So you can see that we've got quite a tall bar, and that means that that, that uh, warehouse is quite full. It's like, that's that 75% full or something. And so the bar has gone red saying, oh, by the way, there's quite a lot of it. If we had a lot less plastic, the bar would be down here somewhere and would be green to tell us that we we're absolutely fine. Uh, maybe in theory, it should, it should the light should go should fill up from the top down. I don't know. It, it's a little bit odd. Because, or if at a glance, if this was very, very low or had run out completely, I might think there was a problem. I'm not sure what the best way to run this 
this is, but it, yeah, anyway. So plastic is, is now working the other way around, and it tells us how much there is in the overflow area, and if that gets too high, then it goes red to warn us that there could potentially be a problem there. He's also removed the alerts, so we shouldn't get warnings popping up over here if there's problems there. Now, we, it does say low rocket fuel at the moment. Uh, that might be one to take a look at. The iridium, holmium, and um, some of the other stuff, we shall uh, we shall look at in a little bit more detail in uh, uh, later on, or possibly in another video, because there was there was there were some problems there. But we'll come back to those. The relevant part from here is to notice that over here we have a serious iron deficiency, um, and this is because well, it, it, it's an in progress thing. So I touched previously on how over here the iron production system that we had, that we've been using for quite a while, is very, very old tech. It's using tier one beacons, it's using uh, basic chemical plants, it's using industrial furnaces instead of advanced furnaces. This could all be a lot better. The copper ones are even worse because they're using tier two modules as well. However, our demand for copper seems to be much lower, which is very strange for late game Factorio. But our demand for copper does seem to be much lower, so we're not so worried about that one. But the reason that the iron area is so empty is is because Mark has cut it off uh, and he stopped he stopped producing we've, we've in theory stopped producing iron and steel over here now we have a bit of a backlog there's quite a lot of steel here we will eventually churn through all of this but at the moment it uh, it's all a bit it's all a little it's all we're all trying to try and get rid of it all and that is because Mark has built a new iron smelting area over here and this is going to be using sort of more more modern uh, techniques and you can see that over here we've got we've got a wow we've got a lot of different uh, warehouses going on over here Let, we'll have a look through those in a moment but up here we've got now this is a more modern smelting system so we're using here we using advanced chemical plants, we're using the advanced furnaces. Now there are, there isn't an advanced casting machine, so that just means we have lots of those and then powerful beacons here. He's using compact beacons, which I should talk about in a in a little while because there's yeah there's there's, there's reasons behind that and they're not entirely good ones. And so this is now a, a much later game, probably probably almost using end game tech at this point, uh, we're allowing us. Th then this will presumably produce the iron and the steel about as quickly as we were producing it from the other system. But as you can see, it's a lot smaller. In fact, the good way, the, a nice way to measure this is to take a copy of this and then just wave it against the, uh, the the old system over here. So you can see it's about the same size as this steel production facility that we had before. Um, and so it's about the size of this steel production facility as well and it's about half the size of the iron production facility so by moving over to this new 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 design we have basically shrunk the whole thing down to about a quarter of its previous size granted the station area is quite a lot bigger but we're using faster belts here it's all all running quite it all going to be running quite nicely and what I noticed quite interestingly is the iron and steel ingots are going to be coming out down here at the bottom I noticed we're not making plates I'm not sure whether that's something we should be should be worrying about but uh, but we're not I don't think we use plates any, anymore anywhere really but I hope that Marcus checked that properly but then we have uh, the labelled input station, so we've got coal and wood coming in here. Those are being brought over up here to be turned into the charcoal that's then used for the steel smelting. And then we've got, uh, we've got pyroflux and acid there coming in for, the, for, for various smelting and clean things. Now the interesting part here is that we have four different uh, iron ore input stations. And uh, the way this works is that each, is it sets up the pri essentially sets up priority by force feeding it through from the lower sta from any lower station up into the next one above, and then it won't call for a train unless it's unless it's running low. And so there are, as you can see, there are four different tiers of um, of iron that we want to use up. So firstly, we want to use up anything that comes as a uh, as a byproduct or trash, as it is put here. So that could be from things like the uranium processing, where processing uranium ore will produce you produce a certain amount of uranium, but it also produces stone and iron ore as a byproduct. And you need to get rid of those as quickly as possible because if that jams up, then you, you then your uranium production stops. So that's that's sort of, that's sort of byproduct or trash. Fine, good. Then there's the iron that comes from core processing because again, there's a steady amount of that being produced. We want to get rid of it as quickly as possible. Um, however, it's a slightly lower priority than this one because we do have a system for turning it into into matter and into landfill if we have an excess of it. So that's the second priority because we want to keep using it up because it's basically free but we can deal with it if we have an emergency, if we have too much of it, it can be dealt with on site. So yeah, that's the second priority. Then we want to use it from regular mines on this planet, if there are any of those left. Are there, are there even any any iron mines left on this planet? I don't know, that's a, that's a stone mine, that's a copper mine. I don't know, I can't see any from a quick glance around, but so I'm going to assume there probably aren't, but it's worth having that there just in case there are any, or just in case we sort of, you know, forget. <laughs> and then finally, there's the iron ore that's being brought in from Oliran, which is the space outpost in this case. So Oliran is an iron planet, and that can produce, therefore, lots and lots of iron very, very quickly. It's essentially unlimited, but we want to use that as the lowest priority because these ones get, these ones are essentially, we need to use them up. 
This one, we might as well use it because it re removes the uh, logistics cost of bringing it over because it's just coming in by regular trains. And then this one is essentially unlimited. So as each one fills up, it'll pass off, it'll pass the iron, iron ore straight up into the warehouse above. So for example, if we brought in a huge amount of trash, it would get passed up here and go into this warehouse and that would stop any being brought over from space outposts. Because we're watching for how much is in here, or rather we are looking at the amount, how is this working? Okay, we are multiplying the amount of iron ore in this warehouse by minus one. We're sending it over here, we are adding on 16,000 here, and then we divide that by eight, and that's how many trains we will summon. That's a bit weird. I don't know why this, I don't know why this is here, and why this isn't minus 16, and that isn't minus 8,000, but never mind. So this means that if this warehouse is completely empty, you get a zero coming through here, you get 16,000 there, and therefore you call for two trains. If the warehouse is completely full, then you get a massive number coming through here. You get a negative number here, so you don't ask for any trains. So essentially, we, we will only ask for trains if this warehouse is fairly empty. And that should mean that between the, between the lot of them, we should always have a decent supply of iron available that will go up through here and, allow, and be processed down into the, into the iron and the steel that we need for all the rest of the factory. In order to help get the resources over to the new smeltery area, Tristan is working on putting in a new rail. So we've, we've had this one for a little while, which allows trains to come from this area and go out this way. And the, and the reason there's an angled bit in there is to encourage any trains that want to go from down here in general to up here in general, rather than coming through the middle of the base where things tend to get a little bit congested and then up here and it's all a bit horrible. This means that this route is slightly shorter. And so that means a train from, from down here will come up this way and will in theory go round here and go off to the stations and go off to where, wherever it's needed over this way rather than take rather than taking an awkward route. And that was quite important because all of the iron from Oliran comes from stations down here and, and used to have to go to up here. So that was a big journey and it would, without, without, without being told otherwise, would have gone right through the middle of the busiest, most congested part of the, of the base. So having it come around the top side is much, much more useful. Now this has been built over here, very much for that reason, so we can get the, uh, the, uh, the iron ore being brought from down here to up here quite easily, because they're much closer together. However, we might also want to have other things like wood and coal and, I don't know, trains coming in to get the iron or the steel and might want to come in from over this way as well. So Tristan has started work here on putting in this rail that will go across this lake. So, so far he's got, he's got the landfill down, but he hasn't actually got the rail in place because presumably that the landfill finished more or less at the end of the stream. So eventually this will come over here. Presumably he'll also put an angle on that one and it'll drop in through here and join onto the, onto the rail down here to give another shortcut system or another alternative route that trains can take. It's going to have to be quite a shortcut to uh, eliminate the extra distance of that of that up loop there, but I'm sure it'll be fine. So I touched on that Mark had been using the compact beacons here, and I think this was due to a slight uh, a slight confusion. If we take a look at the beacons available in this game, you have the basic beacon, which is the one we are all familiar with from Vanilla Factorio, and as you can see at the bottom, it takes eight modules. Uh, okay, it doesn't take eight in vanilla, but in this, in now, it takes eight modules, and it has a 50% transmission for, uh, efficiency. So essentially, it can push through half the power of, of eight modules. So if, essentially, four modules if they're all the same. We've then got the wide area beacon, which is similar but bigger. This one takes 15 modules and pushes them through at 50% efficiency for 7.5 module effectiveness. Great. Uh, it also has a bigger co coverage area, so it does 14 tiles compared to this one's three tiles. So it's much, much better. You can see why it's called a wide area beacon. Then you get the wide area beacon 2, which has the same coverage area as the wide area beacon 1, but it, but it allows you to go up to 20 modules, uh, so a total overall power of 10 after with the 50% transmission efficiency. And so it's a straight upgrade. You can pull one module you can pull one wide area beacon out and put in a wide area beacon too with more of the same modules and it'll just be a straight upgrade in, in its place. You don't need to worry about redesigning. The third type of beacon is the compact beacon. And these ones don't allow you to put in quite as many modules and they don't cover anything like as much area. However, they have a higher transmission efficiency. So in a few specialized cases, if you only have a very, very small number of machines and you want to use the most expensive modules, then they can be useful. So for example, up in space where we've got two science labs next to each other, we might want to make a relatively a smaller number of tier nine speed modules perhaps because they're really expensive and then use a compact beacon to get a slightly, to get a slightly better transmission efficiency out of them. But as you can see, the number one of these gets 10 modules with a 75% transmission efficiency, so seven and a half, exactly the same as the wide area beacon. The compact beacon two gets 10 modules at 100%, so it's the same number of modules, but it boosts the uh, transmission efficiency. But again, that's the same total beacon power or total module power as the wide area beacon two. 
And so because the wide area beacon 2 will cover a much larger number of um, machines, for a larger build like this one, you're going to be much better off using the wide area beacons because, okay, you need to put more modules in them, you need to put twice as many modules in them, in fact. However, it's going to cover more than twice as many buildings. Therefore, it's much, much better. So, for example, you can see here, this compact beacon is going to cover eight of those uh, smelters. If we manage to drop in a wide area beacon too, uh, I don't know where, here, put it here. If we could squeeze it in here and monkey things around a little bit, it's covering 72, that's because that's 12 by 6, 72 different, um, different machines from the one beacon. So yes, it takes twice as many modules, but it also, it covers, it works on nine times as many machines in this particular specific area. Down the bottom, you'll have the same sort of thing. So we've got the, the one beacon in there that is covering four machines. If I switch over to a wide area beacon and don't even do any significant redesigning, we're covering eight machines, so it's equivalent. But also, if you had it like this, you'd redesign it. So you had, um, probably so you had at least four, maybe five high along here. So you'd be covering about 20. So you can see, you can see what I mean. For, for large numbers, of, for large numbers of, of buildings, like in a big build like this, your wide area beacons are always going to be better. For a small, a small build where you've only got one or two machines running, at that point a compact beacon might actually be better. Uh, so yeah, there's a little bit of um, a little bit of redesign work is going to be required here. I think Mark realised this after he put it down, and it was a little bit too late. So we'll probably see an, another version of this in uh, in next week's video. I was going to say while we're talking about science, but actually, I, I, science was about three, three or four chapters ago. I haven't been talking about that for a little while. But you know, on the sort of whilst whilst this video is a little bit about science, let's take a look at what Tristan's been doing with the with the advanced science because he's, I believe, he's got this one actually up and running now. And this was tragically not quite as exciting. We didn't get a big alert saying, ta-da, you've made the first advanced science pack, uh, because we made the first one absolutely ages ago before they changed the recipe on us. Uh, but as you can see down here, we do now have the advanced science packs being made properly using the new recipe, using the new, the new, the new designs as, as, as we require. And so over here we have a train. I imagine this is a three-stop train. Yes, it is. So this train runs from, let's see, well, it goes it goes over to here first, so all the way over on the other side, where the, these two science packs are being are being made. Um, this has stopped because of I don't know why. Um, but anyway, the idea is over here. We are making the first two data cards for the science pack: the um, quantum computing data and the up arrow data, power density data. Those are being made over here. Why have you stopped? Because you've run out of energy control units. Why have you stopped? Because you've run out of thermofluid. Great. <laughs> okay. So possibly some little bits of boosting is required up here on these on, on the coolanting up here. But Tristan has expanded this a little bit to uh, to try and take up the uh, the slack in what's required. So he's put in the, this was all one machine doing absolutely everything originally. He's, so he's put in a second manufactory, he's put in another three of these electromagnetic facilities, and then another three quantum supercomputers up here. So yes, it's expanded a little bit. He still needs to think a bit about the input rate of the energy control units and the cooling rate of the thermofluid up here. So this this needs a little bit of expansion still, but. It does mean a train can come over here, and if we look in this box, there's, okay, there's loads and loads of the accordion data and a certain amount of the upvote data. Um, so, yeah, there's a, there's a bit of, there's a bit of, um, a bit of supply over here. So the train will come from here. It'll, I'm not sure what the order it, order it is. It doesn't really matter. It'll come over here to grab those. It'll come down here to grab the uh, these ones, the satellite, the GPS data uh, from from that's, that's being produced by this probe uh, rocket launcher here. That's taking out the I don't even know what these things are called. The uh, remote sensing probes, and those go into here. Is this remote sensing data or something? In remote sensing data, not GPS data. Who cares? Uh, the train will pick that one up as well, and then bring it up to here, where it can then all be dropped off into this warehouse. It can then be combined with the rainbow cat. Catalogs. The rainbow catalogs are made by combining all of the other catalogs, and these are tier three catalogs as well. So this ain't cheap. This is pulling in tier three catalogs of all four of the main space sciences, and then chomping them together and turning them into these rainbow catalogs you see before me. And how many does it produce when it does that? So it takes in one of each and produces two combined catalogs. That's kind of stingy, if I'm being honest. I would would hope it would at least produce four of them because that just seems slightly fairer. Um, and the amazing thing is they then get taken in and they use as, as a uh, ingredient for this for this catalog. So for this one, you bring in one one of each thing and it produces one advanced catalog. That completely breaks the conservation of, of memory cards thing that's been going on before. I sort of feel that bringing in four of these catalogs should produce four rainbow catalogs, and then each one of those rainbow catalogs and Maybe four of each of the um, each of the other data should then produce four of the advanced catalogs, but maybe that would be, make it all a bit too easy. I don't know. It's just, it's just making things expensive, but that's fine. I mean, that, that's how Factorio goes. You want you want the later challenges to be harder. It's just I'm, 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 
really, I'm just objecting to it breaking the sort of the conservation of data cards that we had that seems to go on through much much of the rest of the game. But I guess that's because it's a Crastorio thing rather than an Arendelle thing. So I, yeah, I don't know. Although that said, the update to the recipe was all, all came out with the uh, space exploration update. So. Let's just say I don't. I don't really know. But then we can chuck that. Yeah, we can. As, as usual, we can then chuck those down here. They'll be. They're being fed into the uh, in, into the labs over here, and we can do advanced data, which is really exciting. I noticed that over here we seem to have run out of all of the normal data cards, which is a bit of a concern, and all of the normal science packs, as well, the basic, very very basic science packs as well. I'm wondering if that's because the train is waiting until it fills up with a number of the advanced science packs, and that's just straight up not happening. Let's have a quick look at that because I think, yeah, here. We, here we go. Here's the one that picks up the sciences. And of course, there's no advanced data kit packs being put in here because, you know, they're just straight up aren't any being made over here. They're being made somewhere else. And in the train, yes, we are indeed still watching for these uh, advanced science packs. So let's limit the train like that. And then, boom, the train relieves because the train was waiting until it was full and it was never going to fill up because it wasn't going to get any advanced science. So that's um, that's going to cause us some problems with science, but um, never mind. At least, we, at, least, at least I spotted the problem and sorted it out. We can now get that fixed next time. And so, I think this has been rather a long video already. Let's cut it here, and this may turn into a three-video three week. We shall see how it goes. But, as ever, thank you very much for watching. I shall be back tomorrow with some more of all of the stuff we've been up to around around and about the factory. This is, this is turning out, to, as I said, it's turning out that we did quite a lot of stuff here. And don't forget to come back on Monday when there'll be another Factorio Space Exploration and Crastorio 2 stream where we'll be fixing all the problems I've talked about and finding new ones to bash our heads against. <laughs> and on Wednesday, of course, there'll be the Satisfactory stream, and, uh, and then at the weekend, there'll be the usual videos as well. So, lots of stuff going on on the channel. Make sure you're around and you don't miss anything. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.